pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon back on assignment in Arizona. I'm Tony Kornheiser. You'd be having that assignment medium or medium rare, because there's no other reason you're out there except to eat. You eat it. Well, wait a minute. You always accuse me of being out here for golf, and now you just right. went to food, even though I'm going to steak 44 in a little bit here. There you go. And they're going to comp the whole bill because you just mentioned them. That's just a no, wise move. Not. I admire that. Not the best have. thing in the world. Sure they will. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, the Warriors gag. Aaron Rodgers starts non-contact practice. And Troy Aikman joins us for five good minutes. But we begin today with the quarterfinals of the NBA in-season tournament being set. Boston will play Indiana. New Orleans will play Sacramento. The Knicks will play Milwaukee, and the Suns will play the Lakers. Some of these teams, like Boston, got in by running up the score. Boston kept their starters in the game in the fourth quarter against the Bulls last night to guarantee point differential. Wilbon, your thoughts on who won and how they won? Tony, I, I don't care about who won or the matchups going forward, even though I'll be in Las Vegas to watch the semis and the finals. But I care about the how they won because that was noteworthy last night. I'm watching these games because I watch the games. I don't need a in-season tournament to, to watch the games in the regular season. I don't need that. So I'm watching some of these, like my Bulls get throttled by Boston. Jason Tatum's in the game. at the They're up 30 or close to it. And Missoula says to Billy Donovan during a stoppage in play, you know, hey, here's what we're doing because they're hacking Drummond on the Bulls, who's one for six at the line, to intentionally run up the score because point differential, as you outlined yesterday, yeah. Yeah, is what matters. Yeah. Also, the Knicks had to run it up on Charlotte for that reason. The Cavaliers, players talked about afterward, the assistant coaches checking on scores around the other group situations to figure out what their differential needed to be. This is a bad idea. I'm not going to say that playing the tournament's a bad idea, even though I don't care about it, because it's popular. The games are closer. They're sold out. People watch. I'm not going to get on that today. But you can't have this point differential being a tiebreaker. You can't have it. Candace Parker had a great idea last night on Turner when she said, look at the standings and the standings. Because Oklahoma City and Minnesota aren't even going to be in this thing. They can't even advance. Mm -hmm. Find a different tiebreaker. All right. So uh, I'm going to agree with you about the point differential. It is worrisome to me because it's not how basketball or football or baseball has ever been played. It changes what's important about winning. It's not winning, it's by how many do you win. Yeah. And I can't believe there won't be repercussions with this because that's not how coaches coach and that's not how players play. I don't want to knock the tournament either. I don't know enough about it. I don't really understand it, but I look at the standings and I see Denver, the defending champion, 12 and five, Philadelphia 12 and 5, surprising Orlando 12 and 5. They're not in it. No, Minnesota 13 and 4, they're not in it because they needed to win by like 47 points. So it, I'm having a little bit of difficulty, although you when I found to out today that every member of the winning team, every member of the winning team gets $500,000, I thought that was pretty good. We move on. But we stay with basketball. The Golden State Warriors blew a 24 point lead last night and lost at Sacramento. The Warriors are now 8 and 10. They've lost 8 of their last 10, 9 of their last 12. Steve Kerr says his team is not in free fall, and when they foul less and improve on turnovers, they'll be really good. Wilbon, are you seeing what he's seeing? Not yet, Tony, but there's every reason to give Steve Kerr and Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and Draymond Green benefit of the doubt when it comes to basketball and getting better and going back into the laboratory saying, here's where we have to start, Here's where we have to stop. There's every reason to give them that benefit of the doubt, and I will. I said yesterday, I don't want to see this Golden State thing end. It's too great to watch for damn near 10 years. It's so great to watch, so I don't want to see it end. But, Tony, they foul too much, I think, because they're small. I think that's just my amateur opinion on this. And I don't know. There's so many good teams out there. You mentioned some of them, not just Denver, the champs, but Minnesota and Oklahoma City and young players, Tony, and they're coming. The Shea Gilgis Alexanders and guys, they're coming even for Steph Curry, one of the, who knows, 10 great all-time players. And so the Warriors can't hold off the tide forever, and I worry right. about that. 
Yeah, so I understand why Steve Kerr sees what he sees, because he has coached this group, particularly the core players, to four different championships. He's seen them be so good so often for so long. So I, I understand why he sees that. But, Mike, there comes a point. You know, the cycle in, in sports goes like this if you're a champion. You get good, you get great, you get good, and then you're done. And then you're yeah. done. We don't know when it's going to happen. We often look back in hindsight and we say, oh, that's, that's when they were done. Yeah. yeah. And I know the champions have a will that says we can muster it up and we can win one more. Well, you can't always win one more. And that's where they may be now. Because they the other be players, tired. other than the, the core group is old, and the other players may not be good yeah. enough. They may not be. Yeah. Oh, man. That, it, it's, it, and that was a great game. They played last night, by the way, too, Tony. They got a good game out of Clay Thompson. They got a good game out of Wiggins. But, but then Malik Monk and, and, and De'Aaron Fox, who's fabulous. Again, these young players are coming for them. I don't mean just Steph and Golden State. I mean, you can include the Lakers in there, too. Let's move to the latest college football playoff rankings. As predicted, unbeatens Georgia, Michigan, Washington, and Florida State, in that order, took the top four spots. They were followed by four one-loss teams, Oregon, Ohio State, Texas, and Alabama. So do Oregon and Ohio State deserve to be five and six? Sometimes in the break, I know you're eating Doritos, so take some Doritos out and eat them because I'm going to go for a while. They absolutely <laughs> deserve to be five and six because they lost to unbeaten teams, okay? Texas at seven lost to Oklahoma, a two-loss team. Alabama at eight lost at home to Texas, a one-loss team. Oregon lost at Washington to an undefeated team. Ohio State lost at Michigan to an undefeated team. Mike, I can make the case that Ohio State should be ranked over Oregon because the team they lost to is ranked higher than the team that Oregon lost to. And they have more Power Five conference victories, and they have more bowl-eligible team victories, and they have a higher strength of record, whatever that is. But I'm going to leave that aside for a second and tell you something that happened on my podcast today when I had Booger McFarlane, and a, a son of the SEC, an LSU alum. And I said, I assume that if Alabama beats Georgia, they both get in, because the committee is going to let Georgia try and defend its two-time national year. championship. Let me tell you what Booger said. Neither of them are getting in. Yeah. Neither of them. I said, Booger, that's impossible. The SEC is dominant. They've won something like four in a row or five out of six. And he said, no, no. Michigan is going to get in. Florida State, if they're an unbeaten team in a Power Five conference, they're going to get in. The winner of Washington and Oregon is going to get in. And he said, Texas has to get in over Alabama. No, Can they you don't. imagine no, they don't. this tournament? Can you imagine it without an SEC team, I can't. Booger makes a persuasive said, case. He makes a great case, Tony. But just to answer the first question, which is, that, you know, because I don't love this particular show and this particular CFP thing like you do. I do. Yes, I those do. two teams deserve to be five and six. Of course they do. They deserve to be. Yeah. The, for all the reasons that you said, six and five, five and six, who cares? But right. you mentioned every one of those four games, uh, the, the challenge, the, the team that's 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 in position to move on could lose there could be an upset could, in each one of those games well michigan's not going to lose coming up yeah, aaron Rodgers is starting to throw at practice we're going to ask troy aikman about the risk reward oh, of playing this season we'll also ask him about the choice the bears could face in keeping justin fields or drafting caleb williams Back to I, it's hard for me to believe that Booger, again, a son of the SEC. Pardon the Interruption is presented by Bullet. Welcome back to Pardon the Interruption, presented by Bullet. Part of Happy Hour. We have some NFL questions for our friend ESPN Monday Night Football Analyst Hall of Famer Troy Aikman. Always great to see Troy dress up for us. Classes up the show. Love that. Uh, I joke. <laughs> The Jets um, cleared Aaron Rodgers, I want to get this quote right, for functional football activity, but no contact earlier today. You were a quarterback. If you were in his shoes, how would you, you know, weigh the risk and the reward of actually playing again this season? Yeah, Tony, I, I you know, players want to play. 
I, I think there's always this idea, hey, if they're out of the playoffs, uh, anything can happen still as we look at this. It, it, it looks doubtful, as we know. They've got the, you know, tied for the second worst foot, uh, record in the AFC. But I think players want to play. And I think for Aaron Rodgers, he looks at it probably saying that he can help this team. Maybe they can get in. But I think also it's a little bit of a feather in his hat if he were to able to come back from a catastrophic injury week one to his Achilles at his age and and be able to play uh, in the same season. That would really be remarkable. But uh, I, I know that whether it's Aaron Rodgers or the Jets, they're going to evaluate this. And if there's any risk that he is at jeopardy of what may happen going forward, uh, I, I can't see him playing. Well, we'll move to the Bears and their quarterback situation, Troy, where it's about 60 years of trying to find a quarterback who can actually perform functional football activity. But you saw Justin Fields up close and personal Monday night. Of course, they could have the top pick in the draft. Troy, have you seen enough? Did you see enough to tell you what they should do when it comes to keeping Justin Fields or moving on? Uh, I, I have not. Um, and, and nor should I, for that matter. I, I, I think that the people in the building are, are going to have to be the ones that are with them on a daily basis to make that decision. But I'll be honest, early in the season, I thought if you have the number one pick, uh, I, I, I thought they'd be crazy if they, if they didn't use it on one of the quarterbacks coming out, whether that's Caleb Williams or Drake May. Uh, but then he went through that stretch of games prior to the injury and then coming off of the injury against Detroit where I thought he looked like a different player. I thought he was, he was really decisive. He was good with his feet. He was getting the ball out on time. He was making plays with his legs, which he always is capable of doing. You know, the game Monday night was tough. It was a tough opponent, tough defense to face. So I think the verdict is still out on him, and he's still auditioning somewhat. I, another question is, if they do keep, they've got to make a decision on whether they're going to ex, uh, exercise this fifth-year option. And so they, they've still got, you know, some decisions there to make as well if they do decide to keep him. But what's going to, what's the situation with the head coach? Is that going to change? You know, how do you want to build this thing? I, I don't know all those answers, but I do know that they've got some really high draft picks and you can, you can get a really good player but there's going to be growing pains with that guy as well at quarterback, or you can get some better players around you. And I think the model that has worked out in that regard is Philadelphia uh, and the way that they built that team up around Jalen Hurts. And then he worked hard in the off season and became a different quarterback from the one that I saw the first year that he was the starter. And it's worked out really well for them. Uh, we'll broaden it out from teams to a league. And, of course, you're familiar with the Tom Brady comments that he sees a lot of mediocrity in today's NFL. Alex Smith pushed back. I am drinking, in this case, the Tom Brady Kool-Aid, agreeing with him down the line. But you watch as much of this as anybody, Troy. How do you see this NFL today vis-a-vis -vis the one you played and starred in? Well, let me just say this first. If you're Tom Brady... It isn't everything mediocrity? I mean, if you're whatever you're watching, it doesn't it doesn't quite compare to him. Uh, I, I mean, he thinks I was mediocre compared to what he was able to. He better not. He better not. <laughs> no, but I I think the, the it's a hard one to to answer because there there was some bad football when I played. Uh, I was a part of some bad football, uh, and there's been bad football. This year, and there was bad football last year, and, and, and that will continue. But I do think that his point is well taken. I, I, I think that some of the fundamentals of playing the position, I think he was speaking mostly to the quarterback position, has been taken away because of the protection that's been afforded to receivers or to quarterbacks. And, and so it's taken uh, a little bit away from what was once required in order to protect your players. Now they're protected because of the rules. So I've had these conversations with Tom in years past. I, you know, he came into the league uh, at a time when quarterbacks weren't protected, receivers weren't protected. So he's best able to really speak of how the game has changed and it's changed a lot. So uh, I think he'll learn like I have that we, we all at some point have to get back or get past whatever it was that we played or how we played and accept it for what it is now. 
That's such a great line of yours that when you're Tom Brady, everything does look mediocre. That's really good. That's 100% true. I will get you out of here on this. This is a personal thing. Jerry Jones has finally pledged to put Jimmy Johnson into the Cowboys' ring of honor. You know both these people very well. What was your reaction to that news? Uh, re really happy for Jimmy. Um, I mean, it goes without saying. It's long overdue. Uh, I, I always knew that Jimmy would get in the ring of honor. It was just really a matter of when. And, and my hope, and I think I speak for all of my teammates, is that when it happened, it would be Jerry Jones uh, meeting him at the 50-yard line and giving him a big hug and, and, and telling him congratulations and thanking him for the job that he did for those teams of ours in the 90s. So I, I thought, Tony, that once Jimmy got into the Hall of Fame, I didn't think the Ring of Honor was going to be as meaningful to him, but I was wrong because I had conversations with him. And this is a big deal to him. It's a big deal to all of those players that were a part of those teams. And I think it's a big deal to Jerry Jones as well. So uh, I'm excited about it. It'll be on ABC, ESPN, December 30th. I'll be calling the game, and I can't wait to see him go in. And it's That's the right great. thing, and I'm glad great. you're going to be there. It is it's the right, the right thing. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, guys. Troy. You can catch more Troy on Monday night as the Bengals face the Jaguars. Let's take one last break still to come. We have a development in the Angel Reese situation at LSU. Also really a real development. And Mark Cuban yeah. reportedly is going to sell the Mavs, but still run them. Ah, wonder how that would work. Tonight on Sports Center at. Pardon the interruption is presented by Bullet Frontier Whiskey. Please drink responsibly. Part of Happy Hour, and in part by Goodyear. Discover the possibilities. Goodyear, more driven. Happy time, people. Happy 29th birthday, Julius Randle. The 6'8 forward was the seventh overall pick in 2014 by the Lakers out of Kentucky, where he went to the national championship game as a one and done. Randall went to New Orleans as a free agent in 2018, then to the Knicks as a free agent in 2019. Made two All-Star games, two All-NBA appearances. Last season, Randall averaged 25 points a game, shot 46% from the floor. This year, Randall had 25 and 20 last night. He's averaging 19.9 points, 10.2 rebounds, 5.2 assists. He's shooting a woeful 39.5% from the floor, 27.5% from three, and he's taking six threes a game. If Randall can shoot, the Knicks might be better than 10 and 7. He's going to get it back, Tony. It's coming slowly. Julius Randle, easy to root for. Uh, uh, look, he, he's, there are flaws in his game, but he plays hard. And he and Tibbs seem matched in terms of their intensity and what they're trying to do. I think his shooting is going to come around. It's just taking a while longer than he wants. Happy anniversary, Vince Young, on this day 14 years ago. Titans quarterback concluded a 99-yard drive with a touchdown pass to Kenny Britt on the last play of the game for a win against the Cardinals. After the game, Titans owner Bud Adams proclaimed, quote, I about peed my pants, unquote, while watching <laughs> Young engineer the winning drive in which he attempted 16 passes. Young passed for 387 yards, <coughs> excuse me, led Tennessee to its fifth straight win after taking over for Kerry Collins. Young was Rookie of the Year in 2006. He made two Pro Bowls in the NFL, but his greatest football moment was winning the national championship in Texas over USC in 2005. Young is currently a special assistant to the athletic department at his alma mater. Yeah, Tony, I was at that national championship game. That's one of the what a that's game. one of the all timers, right? Yep. I mean, you can you can yep. you can put all the helmets away and said, let me pull this clip out, boys and girls. Trump's just about everything else. Does. Happy trails to last night's game for number eight Miami. The Hurricanes came into Rupp Arena undefeated, averaging 89 points a game, boasting the nation's best percentage from three, 45.8 percent. And the Hurricanes left badly beaten by number 12 Kentucky, 95-73. Miami was only five of 19 from three. Kentucky gave five freshmen sizable minutes, shot 59.7 percent from the floor, nearly 43 percent from three. Senior Antonio Reeves led the starters with 18 points, and freshman Reed Shepard, whose parents both played at Kentucky, came off the bench for 21 points. Shepard was actually rated behind Kentucky's other freshmen, Justin Edwards, DJ Wagner, and Aaron Bradshaw. As usual, Mike, Kentucky is loaded. Tony, both our careers really started and shifted into a gear covering men's college basketball. You and I. That's right. 
You know what, That's Tom? Right. I love it. I can't get into it yet. I can't. I don't know who's on the teams. I know the coaches. That's all I know. I'll hopefully get into it after the Super Bowl, but that's not a good thing that it's reduced to a six-week sport, and I don't care about men's college basketball right now. I won't even watch it yet. Quick to the big finish. Kim Mulkey Let's says Angel Reese will play tomorrow against number nine Virginia Tech. Your thoughts? Why was she out the other games? I don't know what to make of this whole thing. I'm sure social media will inform us. Mark Cuban reportedly intends to sell the majority of the Mavs to Miriam Adelson, but continue to run basketball, opts himself. That makes sense to you? Cash out, still run the team. Have your cake and eat it. LaMelo Ball is expected to miss several weeks with an ankle sprain. Big deal? Tony, yes, he's their best player, and they're 5-11. and 11. I can't win without him. Deshaun Jackson says he'll retire as an Eagle Friday. How are you going to remember his career? Great deep threat, faster than everybody. More 60-yard-plus touchdowns than anyone ever. Last one, Oilers beat the Golden Knights for their third straight win. Is that significant? Yeah, Mr. they're 6-3 and three now in their last nine. The McDavid's getting hot. They're coming as well. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, knuckleheads. And now, your sports center. What a surprise. PTI. All right, Wilbon, is the point differential tiebreaker in the NBA's in-season tournament good for the game? No, Tony, it's bad for the game. Um, and, you know, they might have gotten, the league might have gotten a little lucky last night because they had some situations that could produce hard feelings. I mean, they, they, they could produce conflict and just manufactured conflict in order to have tiebreakers. And this is not good for the game. It's not good even for the in-season tournament. You don't want to have teams out there with their starting five up 27 trying to, you know, make up a 40-point differential in the fourth quarter by keeping them on the court. You know, you don't want that. It, it, it works in, in ways that the game of basketball doesn't work naturally. It's totally manufactured. You got coaches out there saying, hey, I'm following your guy because I need more possessions to make up the point differential. No, that's bad. Yeah. That's got to go. Yeah, I mean, I understand that they have an in-season tournament to keep – interest in the league alive early on when football is dominant and when you have these regular season weekday games that are mostly garbage and so you want to make sure they're important and they become important this way for a week or two and, and I understand that but to me point differential is a soccer concept it's a goal differential in soccer so that you can as we talked about the other day if you're the United States you can get past Trinidad and Tobago, because even though you split games, you had more goals against them than they had against you. I agree with you. I think that this devalues our concept of winning in sports like basketball, football, and baseball. As Herm Edwards said, you play to win the game. He doesn't say you play to win the game by six or by eight <laughs> no. or by 47. <laughs> it's just to win the game. And when you do this, there will be repercussions. There will yeah. be hard feelings against certain teams and certain players. Yeah. This is not how coaches coach. This is not how players play. The buzzer ends the game, and whoever wins, wins. And you shouldn't be piling on. And I know sometimes we talk about football, that somebody got beat by 50, and you say, well, go out and stop them. But they're not trying to score to get, a, you know, to get into a tournament. I... I don't like yeah, this, something and I need it explained to me better. Yes. Something that's manufactured, yes. Tony, and it doesn't even speak to getting the best teams in this tournament. Because Minnesota ain't uh, no. in it. And they're the best team in the West in right now. Philadelphia's not Denver, in it. Come no. on now. Don't, don't, don't. No. Liberty, put your hand up. No, watch this hand. No, watch that one. That's it. We are done. Back to you.